anything in real life that is cyclical, that repeats itself, it can be modeled by a sine and cosine graph. So we're going to get questions with tides, because tides come in, tides go up, and they're cyclical. And then they're predictive, because we can use mathematical models to say what's the water going to be at at such and such a time. We're going to look at, we have a question with a Ferris wheel, anything with a wheel, anything that goes around and repeats itself. You can predict where things are going to be, and you can create a model that represents that. Now this first question is the easiest one because they actually give us the equation. In the second and third questions, they're just going to give us information, and we use that information to create a graph, then we use our graph to find dab C and create our equations. All right, so first, this question says the depth of water in a harbor is given by this equation, and we want to sketch the graph. So we're going to use our dab C technique. And as you get better at dab C, first thing you're going to get better at is sort of gauging where you're going to make your axis. So you're going to look at your G value, which is 13.7, and your A value, which is 4.5, and kind of decide, I don't need any negative Y values. Don't really need any negative X values. Choose a place somewhere to be 13.7. That's our center line. Then we're going to go up and down 4.5. Okay? This would be a bad choice for going down 4.5. I tried to really embellish it. Some of you guys on your graphs on the boards, whew, scale. We have scale issues. If this is 4.5, that would leave like 9 for this little, that doesn't make sense, right? So we have to sort of gauge where would 4.5 be approximately? On your exam, they do not take out a ruler and say you're allowed a certain percentage error for your scale. But I need to adjust where I think 4.5 would be below, and then obviously that would be the same distance above. And if I minus 4.5, I get 9.2. If I add 4.5, I get 18.2. That's my A value. We use the A value to write our max and our min. Our period is equal to 2 pi over our B value. And our B value is 0 0.16 pi. Type that into your calculator. And you get 12.5. So whatever your period is, choose a spot along your x-axis and mark that and divide that into four equal sections. So again, to divide it into four equal sc sections, scale-wise, start by cutting it in half. You know something is cut in half if both sides are relatively the same. And then cut each of those in half, and you will nicely divide it into four sections. Then we can label half of 12.5 is 6.25, half of 6.25 is 3.125. Three of those would be 9.375. And your B value is done. Now normally you dot, draw your dotted line next and then do your shift. Do you see in the equation here there is no shift? So you could draw your dotted line and then fill it in. We'll just fill it in right from the beginning. We are doing a negative coast graph, means that it starts at a minimum. First ticking mark is center line, second ticking mark is maximum. Center line, minimum. And we've drawn our graph. Now, for those of you that are going to be taking 
either AP calculus next year, some people decide they don't want to do the AP calculus but still want to take another math class, taking the applied math class. We're going to, in the next step, learn how to use our graphing calculators to solve the next question, and then we'll look at an algebraic way if you just had a regular calculator as well. Okay? Uh, if you don't have a graphing calculator and you want to do these kind of questions at home, you can download the following app on your phone. It is excellent. It's still dead. Did you plug it in? I did the time that um plug it in for you. Lend you mind. I plugged in the night of the last time we were in the Maybe the other part wasn't plugged in. Hmm. We'll see. I'll charge it here. I'll let you use mine. Do you want red or yellow? Mm -hmm. So the second question here says, and I use some big English words. So first of all, a bulk carrier, that's just some sort of big ship needs at least 14.5 meters of water to dock safely. In other words, when you come into the dock where ships park, certain times that the tide goes down, it's going to hit the ground. And other times, it's going to have enough water. So according to this, if I put 14.5 on here and I draw a straight line across, it's only from this time to this time, which I'm going to highlight here, it's only between those two times that the water is deep enough. Everywhere else, it's not deep enough. So if this ship has to come in, deliver something, get loaded up again, we have to figure out how much time does it have? How quick should we do it? So we need to find these two points. So what's going to happen is we're going to type this into our calculator. So we've got the negative 4.5 cos 0.16 pi. We have to make sure that we are in radians. And then if the question had a theta, we don't have a theta button. We can just push the x beside the alpha. So we do need to make sure that we have some sort of variable in there. Plus 13.7. And if you push graph, chances are you see this. And we want to see this. We want to see this graph. So what's happening? Well, the window that your calculator is showing you is right now from minus 10 to minus to, to plus 10. And from, there we go, go straight down. That's what the screen is showing you, and that's why we only see this little part, because the window is set up to go from minus 10 to 10 and minus 10 to 10, generally. Unless you've changed it from something else, then you might see, right? Maybe someone has their window way up here, and you see nothing. That is also a possibility. So it's important that we know how to graph this by hand, because on our calculator, we're going to use the window button and say, on my x, I need to see past 12.5. I like to always keep a little bit of negative because then I can see my y-axis. So I'm going to go from negative 1 up to 15. And then on my y, again, I don't need to see much negative, but I like a little negative so I can at least see my x-axis. And it went up to 18.2, so I'll go up to 20 just to make sure. 25 would be fine. Just depends how much of a window you want to see. The scale thing, if you want, if I want to make these every 3.125, I can do 3.125, and it will draw them for me that way. On my Y, right now the scale is 1, but maybe I just want to go by 5s. So that when I hit graph now, it appears. And you see 3.125, 6.25, 9.375, and 12.5. Five, 10, 15, 20 along your y-axis, it looks a lot like the graph that we drew. Now that we have that in there, we can go back to y equals, and we can add 14.5 into the second graph. That'll draw a nice horizontal line. 
And so if we can find these two intersection points, right, we can find this point and go straight down and figure out what it is, and this point and go straight down and figure out what it is, then we'll be able to subtract those two times and find out how long it can be safe. So your calculator does this. Anything you want to calculate on your graphs is right above the trace button that says calculate. So if you push second calculate, it lets you figure out all sorts of things from your graphs. Values, x-intercepts, minimums, maximums. We're going to use number five, the intersection point. So you can either go down to number five or just push the number five. You can find the derivative, the integral. That's next year. If you do the intersection, it's going to ask you for the first curve, which is one of the curves we want. We push M. It's going to ask you for the second curve. It automatically goes to a second one. If you had three, this is why it's asking you which ones, because if you had three graphs, you have to decide which two you want to find intersection. But we only have two. Push enter on the second one. It always asks you to guess, which everybody just quickly pushes enter on. Like, I think it's going to be there. Okay. And it tells you the value, 9.02. So I can go to my graph now, and I can say, I know this one's at 9 point of green, 9.02. I do the same thing if I want to find the other one. Second, calculate, intersect. But if I push enter on the first curve and enter on the second curve, it always finds the intersection the closest to wherever your cursor is. So right now, I want to find this one. I have to click over until I get closer to that one. Technically, that's probably enough. I'll go a little bit more just to make sure. Okay. On Desmos, it's really nice, because on Desmos, it's much more intuitive. You're like, I want to find this point, so you go with your cursor. As your cursor gets close to the intersection point, Desmos makes a big little dot saying you probably want to find this, right? And you're like, yeah, and you click on it, and it tells you right away. Whereas this, you have to do some more instructions. Is my calculator doing degrees? No, I changed it. Okay. Mm. Or did you just move your cursor well, close? You might have had to push enter one more time. So now if I push enter on the first curve, enter on the second curve, enter when I guess, 3.48 is the second. And so if we take 9.02 minus 3.48, safe for 5.54 hours. Now I'm going to show you that um, you could solve this if you just had a scientific calculator. Okay? I'm not going to give you enough time to write it down. It's going to be on the video if you want to see it later. Um, and if you want to write it down later. It's one of those things where, in solving this without a graphing calculator, they're not going to ask you that level of difficulty on the exam. But next year in AP Calculus or in first year university, they will expect that you could do that. So it's kind of sometimes you have those gaps where it's like it's too hard for a grade 11 question on the exam, but now that you're in grade 12, you should be able to do that no problem. So it's good to see either way. Um, so what's going to happen here is, if I'm solving this without a graphing calculator, I would have to plug in the 14.5 for the depth. Then I want to solve for t, and if t right now is inside cos, so does it make sense that I would like to get that cos by itself? 
So what do I do? I move the 13.7 over, I divide by negative 4.5, and I would get cos by itself. Now, this is where, if this question said, see, I'm going I'm to tell you, I'm not going to give you enough time. You can try, but I won't give you enough time to write down. So just listen. If this was just cos of theta, be super easy, right? You could get your reference angle, cos is negative, so it's in quadrant two and quadrant three with the cast rule. That would be so much easier if it was just a theta, because then I could solve for theta. Well, we do that sometimes. Well, if it's easier if it's theta, why don't I make the whole inside theta? Now this looks like a question I could do. Right? I find my reference angle by doing the inverse of the positives. Then I know that it's in quadrant 2 or quadrant 3. So pi minus my reference angle in quadrant 2, pi plus my reference angle in quadrant 3. But we didn't want to find theta, we wanted to find t. But after I figured out what theta is, now I could just substitute back. Because it would be kind of awkward, like if you didn't substitute, you'd have to write this. My 0 0.16 pi t reference angle is, that looks awkward, doesn't it? For reference angle, that would be the right notation. That's my reference angle. And I would have to write 0 0.16 pi t equals this and 0 0.1. It gets a little bit awkward there. So substituting it is nice, but now I can substitute back. So if I substitute back, I divide, and I get my 3.48. Same thing in the other one. Substitute back. I would divide. I'd get 9.02. And get the same answer that I got with my calculator. Of course, if you have technology, sometimes it's nice to get the technology to do it for you. You know how to solve sine and cosine. This one with extra stuff in there, Having that little substitution can be really helpful. You just temporarily take out the messy stuff, replace it with theta, solve for theta like you would normally solve, and then substitute back afterwards. Okay. Here is our next question. A Ferris wheel has a radius of 15 meters and rotates once every 20 seconds. Oh, passengers start at the bottom. It's way, that's so boring. I like the ones where they catapult you and hope that you land on the top chair. It's way more exciting. Oh, we'll make this, I know what, we'll make this Ferris wheel exciting. Yeah. I mean, on a Ferris wheel, when, uh, when it starts, sometimes you are just at the top because the Ferris, because when you're getting on a Ferris wheel, it rotates as each person gets on before the ride actually starts. Fair, but it's not where you get on. You don't, like, get on at the top of the first chair that you take. Anyways, if anyone doesn't know what a Ferris wheel is, I'll try my art skills to draw one. So we've got a big circle. Woo! Of course, it'll be connected somehow. You can make a pie plate out of that. Oh, yeah. You can make pie plate Ferris wheels. So many people would want to go on that. It's so exciting. There we go. Chairs on there. We need a happy customer. There we go. Super happy guy. Sitting on there. So you get on this. That's where you would get on your Ferris wheel. And you would go all the way around. Whee! All a little scary up at the top. Now. Back down. One second. So. We draw the idea that's happening. Now we transfer this into a graph. And when we transfer this into a graph, I'll do it right beside. Does it make sense that you get on here, and that happens to be one meter above the graph? How high will you be when you're at the maximum? How much above the ground would you be? 16 meters? 
No. 31. 31. Oh, 31. Okay. Let's see, how do we figure out that 31? Well, the radius is 15, so that means the diameter is 30. And if you started one meter off the ground, add 30 to that, you would get a 31. Can you see how the radius helps you find the middle value at 16? Oh, wait, never mind. Right, because our radius is 15, so we have to go up 15 and down 15. Yeah, if it would start at zero. And then it tells us in the question that it takes 20 seconds to get all the way around. So I can mark 20 seconds. That would be one period. That's when I'd be back here. Well, I can divide that into four equal sections, 10, 5, and 15. Does that make sense then? Whoa. That's my, my little guy. There we go. Now it would take 10 seconds to get up to the top. And on your way up, at 5 seconds you would be here, and at 15 seconds you'd be, wow. Sometimes when I'm writing to the side, there we go. It doesn't match up with my numbers. And it makes this nice graph. Which continues on. We need to create an equation for this. So we have to think about dab C. Now that we've drawn it. And I write dab C like this with a big dash sideways, sort of separates the C because the dab part's the same, whether you do a sine or a cosine graph. Can you see that your center line is 16 and that your amplitude was 15? We have a formula that says period is 2 pi over your B value, and your B value is 2 pi over your period. We know our period is 20, so our B value is 2 pi over 20. And you could reduce that to pi over 10. I actually like 2 pi over 20 because I like seeing the period in my equation. Now, I'm not going to write anything down for the C part because I can say 15 sine bracket, 2 pi over 20 bracket, bracket, plus 16. Here's a sine graph. Well, where does the sine graph start? Sine graph starts in the middle going up. By my middle going up, that's shifted 5 to the right. So I can write a minus 5 in and create a sine graph. I could create a coast graph. Again, the dab part would be the same. Where does a coast graph start? Coast graph starts at a maximum. The maximum has now been shifted 10 to the right. So I would show that in my equation with a minus 10. Now, both of those equations are right, but I think mathematicians would pick a different one. Can you figure out which one mathematicians would like the most in this situation? What do you think? Uh, negative the negative 15 cos. Normally, mathematicians don't like negatives. They like to stay positive. But in this case, the negative is nice because it starts with, the, uh, starts with no shift. So you wouldn't have to put anything in there. You could just write 20, 2 pi over 20x with no shift whatsoever. What do you think of this Ferris wheel? Would that be exciting? Is, it a, is 15 meters, 30 meters high, is that pretty tall for a Ferris wheel? What about 20 seconds to go around? Is that pretty fast? That seems pretty fast. I mean, yeah, we that's, could... That's a bit more than a meter. 
Okay. We, well, I mean, we could make this very exciting. Um, like, like catapulting up to the top. So we just add a letter to this question. Come on. Can you imagine that Ferris wheel? Even more than a kilometer a second. Well, we could actually calculate the circumference. And 20 seconds to go that dis, I, I think you would die. Uh, I think your whole body would just get... I feel like you'd get flung out as you got to the top. I would be super fast. Right? What do you think? So, I mean, we could do it that way, or we could also do other things. Like make it two seconds? Or, um, oh, make it super oh. Cool. oh my. The only scary part of that is the fact that you'll starve by the time you get back to the bottom. Many hours to go all the way around. Okay. Part B, estimate the height after 22 seconds. Now it says estimate, so you are allowed a little bit of freedom here. Here's 22 seconds. Go up, hit the graph, go across. Jonathan, picking the, what do you think that number would be? At 22 seconds, if you went across, mm. two. two, okay, so our estimate is two meters. If you wanted to find it out exactly, you could go to your graphing calculator, type the equation in, right, so I'm going to type in negative, I'm going to use the negative one, negative 15 cos, two pi over 20. X bracket plus 16. Again, I'm going to go to my window, and now I need to see, I want to see at least 22, so I'll go up to 25. My scale, I'll go by fives this time. Is 20 high enough? No, it went up to 31, so we get up to 35. Hit graph. There's my woo, Ferris wheel. And I can go to second calculate, and one of the things on calculate is value. When it's 22, 3.86. So our estimate wasn't too bad. Actual one, 3.86 meters. Same thing for part C. When will you be 20 meters above the ground? If you were estimating, you could put 20 on here, draw a line across. And say there and there. Then go down and estimate those. If you wanted to find out what they were exactly, we could type 20 into the second one and graph and then go calculate number five. Where do they intersect? And we get 14.14. .14. Which is 0.86 away from 15. So I'm going to say the other one by symmetry has to be 0.86 away from 5. Ooh, does that work? Does that seem logical? Let's see. Like I went, I'm like, that's 0.86 away from this one, so if it's symmetrical, let's calculate intersection. Go to the other one. I'm going to live on the edge. Oh. Think that's enough? That's a lot. 5.86? Yes, it does work. Whoa. Technically, the only thing that's needed in order to figure out maximum and minimum, and the whole graph is one max and one min, as long as they're consecutive. Then you have enough information to figure out the period, to figure out your center line. So the world's highest tides are at the Bay of Fundy. I've never been there. 
I don't know if it's exciting to watch the tides or if it's really kind of, I'm not sure. So the maximum depth of water is eight meters at a dock, but then six hours and 12 minutes later, it's at two meters. So we want to draw a picture of this. We've got a couple of issues we have to work with. 4.30 a.m. It's at 8. I'm, are you okay with 2 and 8 on there? That seems pretty reasonable. And that your center line then would be at 5. But we're going to have some issues with the time on the bottom. Because I don't know how in my calculator to put two dots. It, it just, right? How do you do that? How do you do it? 4.30? You quickly hit the decimal? No. Is that 4.30? Alpha decimal? Does it work? Oh, there are. Does it actually let you do math with that? It's worth a try. It's worth a try. I can. Okay, let's. Yeah. Right. Oh, sure. Four. Whoops, that's not alpha. I'm, I'm never. Um, this is, I'm very curious. If you took 4.30 and times it by 2, you should get 9 o'clock? I get 60 o'clock. Oh, yeah, I don't think this is working. Any other suggestions what we should maybe do with 4.30? Four minutes. We could do minutes. Four hours. Four hours. Military time. Picoseconds. Are you okay if I go with 4.5 for 4.30? Because 30 minutes is half an hour. And what are we going to do with 10.42? Six hours and 12 minutes later. That's going to be about here. It's going to be 10 point something. Will it be bigger than 0.5 or less than 0.5? 10.7. And how did we come up with 10.7? So we take the minutes, 12 minutes out of 60 is 1 fifth or 0 0.2, 42 minutes out of 60, you can divide both of those by 6 and get 7 tenths and get 0.7, see how that works? Oh. Apollo to 16, this is not quite right, is it? Yeah, one fifth. Where did I get 12 from? They took the 12 minutes. So if you took the 12 minutes, you could add 6 to get 10, and add 0.2 to get 0.7. Because this distance between here should be 6.2. Or you could just take the 42, and say 42 out of 60 would be 0.7, and write 10.7, and then calculate the 6.2. So we're given the, only these two points, a minimum here and a maximum here. Does it make sense if it took 6.2 to get to the minimum, it would take another 6.2, in other words, at time 16.9, right? I mean, there's military time, but you could really confuse your friends by just saying, I'll meet you at 16.9, and they'd have to figure that out. They'd just probably stop being friends and be like, oh, I just didn't show up. 16.9, you're going to be back at your maximum again. And then we can label these points in between are going to be 3.1, so that's going to be at 7.6 and 13.8. That's when you're going to be in the middle point. And we've got our sine or our cosine graph. And the question says, come up with an equation in sine and cosine. So we're going to dab see this. 
value is easy as 5. Amplitude easy is 3. The B value is 2 pi divided by your period. And you see that it takes 12.4 for one full period. Because it's 6.2 from maximum to minimum, another 6.2 to get back to the maximum again. Now when we go to write our equation, we'll start with one with sine. 3 sine 2 pi over 12.4 plus 5. Where does the sine graph start? In the middle going up. You could either choose this one, or you could choose this one. What number would this one be at? Minus 3.1. Minus 3.1 off of this. That's a 4. You don't believe me? I'll erase it. Minus 3.1 would give me 1.4. So we can either use the 1.4 or the 13.8. Okay. Right now, I, that, that 1.4 is giving me bad vibes, so I'm going to stick with the 13.8. But the 1.4, mathematicians probably like to start as close to the x-axis as possible. I mean, technically, you could have gone minus and found a point way over here and labeled it. Right? Not recommended, but possible. And we can do one with cosine. Again, the dab part would be exactly the same. And cosine starts at a maximum. There we go. That maximum was 4.5 to the right. So we could do 4.5. And then there's just one more estimate. I don't feel like typing into my calculator again. Um, 1.30. Oh, my goodness. But where is 1.30 on here? 1.30 p.m. 13. If I go to 13.5, go up and over and come up with an estimate. All right, I'm gonna, what are we, what are we thinking? That five's the middle, so think <laughs> why not? We could put a ton of decimals there if we wanted to. Probably four or four and a half would be good enough. Your teacher might get nervous, like you're just supposed to estimate, you weren't supposed to use a calculator. But if you did use a calculator, what went wrong? Because I'm sure that number is not right. So what you're saying is that we should just uh, is that we should just uh, add a bunch of random decimals to the end just to mess with you. No, just to mess. Don't don't get I'm now I'm getting creative of math ways I could mess with you and I think I'd win. Mm -hmm. You're the math teacher. Yes. Or every time I give you your mark back, I make it a little equation so you actually have to solve it. But I make it hard so you probably solve it wrong so you really never know what mark you got on it. Until you put it into our power school. Yes, then you would know. So in your textbook, there's questions at the end. You can circle three to nine. At the bottom of this, there's two more questions to try on your own. 
you probably, I'd say do those two first. Check with a friend to see if you got the same answers. 